That's good, don't you think? Amen? That's good. It's good to be here. If you have your Bible, I hope you have. You turn to the book of 1 John chapter 3 with me this morning, please. If you'd like to stand as we open the infallible book. 1 John chapter number 3. If a man preached from anything less than an infallible book, he wouldn't know what he was talking about, number one. He sure couldn't invest faith in you, number two. And number three would be nothing but confusion, for there was no authority. In 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 1, the divine text says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Right. Beloved, now, present tense, right now, at this moment, at the writing of the book of First John, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Father, bless this holy word now. In thy name we pray, amen. You can be seated. I wanted to start at this point this morning because my message is really about the sons of God. Yeah. But the Apostle John was overwhelmed with the idea that God would make us his son. And of course we are sons of God by two distinct ways I'll deal with in just a few moments. But first of all, I want to take a look at the love of God. The Greek word translated love, as you've heard so many times, as it relates to the love of God, is the word agape. There's a few other words in the New Testament that are a representative of love. One is phileo, the other was eros. For example, you get the word erotic from the Greek word eros, which is the love of a man and a woman. Phileo is a, is a filial type love, the love of uh, friendship and family members and so forth. <laughs> and we get the word <clears throat> Philadelphia from the conjunction of two words, phileo and adelphos. Adelphos is the Greek word for man. So therefore we put the two words together as William Penn did and we get the word Philadelphia, which is the uh, city or town of brotherly love, the love of mankind. And so therefore love plays a very major place in an individual's life. Some of you have lived 30, 40, 50 years in this world. You've never really known anything about love. You've been through one broken relationship after the other, and the relationship is usually today built upon nothing but a fleshly sexual attraction. And when that gets boring or worn out or whatever you want to say about it, uh, then the flesh begins to look elsewhere. And that's exactly the kind of life that people are trying to build in this nation, and that's the foundation they're trying to build their home on, and it won't last. It won't last. The love of God is something that's much greater, much higher, much stronger, much deeper. And words, my friend, will fail you to try to describe it. It's the love that God has for a prostitute. It's the love he has for a murderer. It's the love he has for a religious person. It's the love that he has for a sinner. It is the love of God that is unbounded. It's the kind of love that, that reaches down into the deepest hole and reaches up to the highest level that man could ever attain find you wherever you are in life and there begin to speak to you because he loves you. The Bible said this is a, this, that God is love, John chapter number four, and he certainly is. That's one of his attributes that God loves. I'm in here today because the love of God spoke to me in 1973 and he got my attention. And when he spoke to me, he spoke into darkness. Make no mistake about it, it couldn't have been any darker than the darkness where God found me. So I praise his holy name today and I bless him for who he is. God loves me and because he loves me, I love him. And I respond, I return that love to him. We love him because he loved us. And you say, well, how, how do we do that? Because the love that he put in you, you return to him. You see, you discovered something you didn't know existed until he loved you. And when you latched on to that for the first time in your life, you marveled at something you knew nothing about. And no textbook can define it. They know nothing about it over here on the hill or any other school for that matter. It's the love of God. The only way you can know the love of God is to experience it. 
as much as a human is capable of experiencing that marvelous love, you experience it, and then when you begin to experience it, that even in your weakest, most frail point, your most, where you fail the most, He still loves you. Where you have mocked Him and where you have turned into your religious way, and He still loves you. And then when you realize that it's the love of God that sends forth chastening into your life. And it's the love of God that breaks down barriers and raises barriers. It's the love of God that shuts doors and opens doors. It's the love of God. And He is God Almighty, as they said a moment ago. And I'm so glad this morning that I serve a living God. Amen. The other day I listened to an 11-year-old boy stand outside a church in North Carolina Someone sent me a connection, an email, and I watched this 11-year-old boy stand out there. And he had a sign in his hand, and he was preaching. This kid was preaching to the people coming out of the church. And this church in North Carolina had just sent out the message around the country, we will not marry you if you're heterosexual. We only marry homosexuals and sodomites and so forth. And so they had gathered to, 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 put on a, to, to preach to these people. And I marvel at the people who came out. Most of them just ignored the kid. Some of them listened to him. But I watched one woman in particular who walked down to him and put her arms out like this and said, let me hug you. And what she was doing was condescending and patronizing him and letting him know that he was just a child and she was so much more mature than him. And she wanted to give him uh, parental love and show him something to get him out of this foolish thing that he's The truth is, though, he was preaching the truth. This 11-year-old boy was preaching the truth. You see, someone sent me a thing the other day, and they said, Preacher, it's not the people on the street so much that need to hear the Word. They certainly need to hear it. But he said, Preacher, it's the people in the church houses that get no Word. They get none whatsoever, week in and week out. They get a constant, constant, constant source of nothing but deception and lies. Here are some of the Scriptures, and I'll move through these quickly. Romans 5, 8 said, But God commendeth His love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now think on that this afternoon when you get home because what you just heard from Scripture is an ever-present tense of the Lord God bearing in His body what you're doing at this moment. He bore it then. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah to God. And the Bible says in the book of Psalm 103, verse 4, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Then in Jeremiah 31, 3 and Isaiah 63, 9, these are two of the most beautiful scriptures in the Old Testament. Listen carefully. In Jeremiah 31, 3, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Amen. And then in Isaiah 63, 9, In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, he bare them, and he carried them all the days of old. That's beautiful. Hallelujah to God. That's got power in it. Amen. In Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. So let's look at these sons of God that the apostle John was so carried away with. He said, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. There are two distinct ways that you become a son of God. The number one way that number one is in 1 Peter chapter number 1 verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. In plainer words, Nicodemus, you must be born again. That changes your nature. That changes your essence. But another way that you become a son of God is in Galatians chapter number 4 and verse 5. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Ephesians 1, 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. One, therefore, is by the new birth. The other one is by the act of adoption. And they are completely different. They bear no resemblance whatsoever. They're not connected in any way. 
except that you must be born again to understand when the adoption takes place. One deals with your essence, your nature. Therefore, it relates to your relationship with sin and the Savior. That will be the sonship of the new birth. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1.18 that we are born again, that we've been redeemed. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, bought back. And what were we bought back with? The precious blood of Christ. Born again sons of God have died to the world. Galatians 2.20, the apostle said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Born again, sons of God have been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and all been made to drink into one Spirit. Born again, sons of God have been made alive by the indwelling of the Spirit of God. The apostle says in Ephesians 2, 1, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's a present thing. Don't ever let anybody tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ was born again at his resurrection. That is an abominable misunderstanding of this day have I begotten thee. That has nothing to do with the new birth. The Lord Jesus never needed to be born again because he was never lost. He's the author of eternal salvation to everyone that believeth. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 5, even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Then in Colossians 1, 2, 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, of course, that word quickened as the King James translators put it in the New Testament, literally means to be made alive. But the truth of the matter is it carries a little more content than that. Because the moment God saved me in 1973, everything speeded up. <laughs> Amen. Think about it. It all speeds up. The most bored person on this earth is an unsaved man constantly seeking some new gratification for his flesh some dazzling new experience, some new pleasure, some new thing, and that's all he or she lives for. But once you've been born by the grace of God, born again, saved, washed in the precious blood of Christ, you now draw from a different fountain. Your life source is not here, but it's there. And you are satisfied not with physical things of the flesh. There's a satisfaction that comes deep into the soul of a man. And it's upon spiritual things. It's manna from heaven, water from the rock, something that cannot be produced on this earth. Amen. But the other deals with your relationship to God the Father. Adoption is a legal term that forges a relationship between two parties. Now listen carefully the rest of the message. I'm not going to exhaust this, but I'm going to lay a groundwork for you this morning to have you thinking as you go out the back door. Adoption is something that has to do between you and God Almighty. Between that absolute eternal being that the apostle talks about in 1 Timothy chapter number 6 verses 15 and 16. Who no man hath seen. He dwells in the light that no man hath seen nor can see. To whom be honor and glory everlasting. Almighty God the Father. Adoption is a legal declaration. God operates in a court of law. We know that the accuser of the brethren stands before him. We know Satan brings accusations against the brethren. He's called the accuser of the brethren. In the book of Revelation chapter number 12, we know we have an advocate with the Father. We know the apostle John laid it out and said, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. An advocate is a counselor. He's an attorney. He's a lawyer. He's one that takes your case and presents it to God Almighty on your behalf. That's God's courtroom. But also in God's courtroom, a decree was set forth. This is my son. I adopt him. He belongs to me. I take him as my own. 
Somebody said, why is that necessary, preacher? If we're born again, if we're washed in the blood, if we're saved by the grace of God, why would the adoption be necessary? 2,000 years ago, Julius Caesar was the Caesar of Rome. He was the Caesar of the Roman Republic. But he was assassinated by Brutus. Shakespeare wrote a play about all that. But before Caesar died, he adopted a distant relative whose name was Octavian. Octavian, upon the death of Julius Caesar, became the Caesar of Rome. And he took the name of Augustus. When you read in the book of Luke, chapter number 1, in the days of Augustus Caesar, a taxing went forth into all the land. This was a direct result of the adoption that took place when Julius Caesar died. But the point is this. Nobody dared step in and do anything to change what Caesar had done because the Roman Republic recognized an adoption as a very, very serious legal thing. And the Republic was built upon law. But Caesar Augustus became not only the Caesar of the Roman Republic, but under him it changed from a republic to an empire. Caesar Augustus now has become the first Caesar of the Roman Empire. And lo and behold, this little Jewish settlement on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea is part of the Roman Empire. So therefore, as Augustus Caesar sent forth the command to tax, he was used of God. He was used of God to fulfill the prophecy that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. For they were Nazarenes. They were living in the northern part of the country. But because they had to go back to the land of their birth, to their birthplace, Mary and Joseph had to travel to the south of at least 60 miles. And there in Bethlehem of Judea, according to the book of Micah chapter number 5, the prophet said, O Bethlehem, though thou be the smallest among the tribes of Judah, out of you shall he come forth, who shall be ruler over my people. And so do you see how the providence of God uses something to fulfill the word of God? Even a pagan ruler was used to fulfill God's word. But that's how important adoption was. I'm trying to get you to understand something. Adoption in the Roman world was a very big deal. And so when God lays out in his scripture that you have been adopted, he has a reason for that. In the book of Galatians chapter number 4 and verses 1 through 7, if you'd like to turn there, I want you to read this scripture with me this morning and begin to understand what's going on with the issue of adoption. Adopted sons of God, we have been adopted, but notice how it works. The apostle says in Galatians 4, 1, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. But is under tutors and governors in the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Do you see this? We were children. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now read verse 5 carefully. To redeem them that were under the law. That's the birth, the new birth, the redeemer, redemption. But look what happens. That we might what? Receive the adoption of sons. See the two-step process? First the redemption. First the new birth. First you enjoy and rejoice in that new birth. Hallelujah to God. But you've not been saved too long before you realize the old man's still around. He's still there. Yes, he is. And a lot of times people take a legalistic trip to try to deal with it. They find comfort in that. Others take this sin anyway and grace covers any sin. They take that route. And they're both wrong. What you do is begin to seek the face of God and ask him about what's going on with the two natures in your life. But a lot of people can't handle that. They cannot handle the fact that once they're born again, that old nature still hanging on. The old flesh still wants some of the same old pleasures, same old addictions, same old stuff it used to have. And so you've got to learn how to deal with it. And I will instruct you in this this morning. 
The greatest book in the New Testament written to show you how to deal with the two natures is 1 John. It shows you how to deal with it in the book of Romans. Those two books together are two of the most powerful books in the New Testament to show you how to deal with the two natures. But I want to call your attention to something here now. The fact that you've been made an heir, you've been made a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. This heir, this inheritance, this inheritance has to do with an adoption that takes place when God made a legal decree about who you have become. In the book of Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 15, the adoption of sons has something else to do in your life. And it's very important to get this part. Romans 8, 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Slaves could never call their master Father, but we're not slaves, we're children. Ephesians 1 5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Well, what does that mean for me, preacher? Let me tell you what it means for you. It means this. It means that no matter what condition you'll find yourself in in this world, how low you sink, how far you fall, how bad you get, what sin besets you, where you wind up, how the devil sifts you, and your battles and your battle scars and all these places that you can look back on and they've literally sucked the very life out of your soul. And you come to a point in your life as a Christian where you say, I have failed my God miserably. How in the world could I still be saved? Let me tell you this. That adoption is God's way of letting you know that he has made a legal decree and that cannot be reversed. That's what adoption is about. It cannot be reversed. It stands forever. If you've been adopted as a son of God, you'll always be a son of God. And nothing can change that. The adoption, therefore, has nothing to do with the essence or the way you live or your battles in life or any of that. That has to do with your relationship with the Savior, the Redeemer, the one who saves you. The Bible says we're saved by his life. The Redeemer seated at the right hand of the Father, the Lord Jesus is the one who battles with you in your daily life to give you victory over sin, victory over self. And you see it as that. You understand that. You know that the Lord Jesus Christ not only saved you in the beginning and you were born again by the grace of God, but His continual intercession at the right hand of the Father is saving your life day in and day out. Because you need that. It's not the eternal salvation. That only happens one time. You can only be born again one time. But how many of you know us uh, Christians that have, a, have been born again with a lost life? Amen. I know one in Florida right now who, who is publicly brandishing his fall into sin. He's making a mockery of God. He wants it on Facebook where everybody can see it. And I've been praying for him daily. Amen. Daily I pray for him. Daily I pray for him. This is not said in mockery. Maybe he'll see what I'm saying this morning. Maybe he'll hear this message. But he's fallen to the place now to where he wants everybody to see what he's doing. He wants them to see it. And, it. and a lot of people out there would say, well, there's no way a man like that could be saved. Well, the life he's living is certainly not saving him. The life he's living is killing him. And according to 1 John chapter number 5, if you see a brother sin a sin unto death, don't pray for him. He may come to the point where he sins the sin unto death, but the sin unto death originates from the heart. When the Holy Spirit can no longer convict you, and you can no longer be uh, chastened and no longer be brought back to a place of repentance before God. Whatever sin you commit is irrelevant. The sin unto death happens in the heart. And I, I pray he's not at that point. I pray he gets to the point to where he takes a good long look at himself, looks into the mirror and says to himself, Lord God Almighty, how did I ever get to this place? Oh, my prayer for him is every day. Every day, yes sir, every day. How could I get up here this morning and preach like this if I didn't pray for him? then I would be a rank hypocrite. And I was reading the other day about the man who pastored the church and got 12 years. The woman was in the courtroom and my, my, my. Some things just stand out above other things and this one did. 
She was in the courtroom, courtroom packed out, all these people waiting. Here's the judge, here's the jury, and the judge is going to give him the sentence. And she said she could hear the chains hit the floor as he stood outside the door waiting to be brought into the courtroom. Now let that ring in. Let that, let that, just think about it. Here's a man who preached the word of God. And this woman said, I could hear the chains hit the floor. In other words, he was brought to the door. And then when he got to the door, he was chained and the chains fell to the floor. And then a little after, that's graphic. A little after they opened the door and in he came, he was chained. All right. Chained. Now, chained. Now, that may change that may, will, obviously, and what's going on in Florida or anywhere else is certainly going to change your relationship with the Savior as far as Him being able to work in your life and convict you and a plead for you and seat at the right hand of the Father and all that. He still loves you and He's going to do that. But if you become unresponsive to all of that, you can bring on an early death. But adoption? Ain't nothing you can do. <laughs> That's going to change that. <laughs> you understand? The adoption is God's way of sealing to you ownership. Letting you know without a question, regardless of how you wind up, you still belong to Him. Amen? And that brother's adopted. And that's a brother. And it ought, to, it ought to break your heart. And if you haven't been praying, you ought to be praying. And the greatest thing I'd love to see and rejoice in my heart and my soul is to see the place of repentance and giving glory to the Savior. That's the difference between the new birth and adoption. They both make you sons of God. But the new birth makes you the son of God first. Then adoption seals it. Amen. Can't change that, brother. Amen. When Satan comes back accusing, 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 <laughs> accusing, and he's good at that. Yes. Oh, good night, man. Is he ever good at it? You can't go anywhere to hide from the devil. He'll point out, pick out, or he's got the best memory of anything. He'll accuse you to death. The father says, the son will plead in dealing with that. But the father says, Satan, look at this right here. It is written, he belongs to me. I adopted him. He's an heir with Christ. And that cannot change. If for no other reason you should believe in eternal security, it should be that right there. Father, in thy name we pray. I delivered what you put on my heart. I love you and I bless you and I exalt you and I lift you up, Lord. And I praise your holy name. God, I don't think for a minute that I stand. I could so easily fall. Oh, God, how I could fall. I could be standing at the door with chains on my feet, my hands, my legs. God, I could be. I could be. By the grace of God, I'm not there. And I plead for help. And I pray for mercy. And I ask you to be merciful to me, a sinner. In Jesus' name we pray. I pray you'd help the people in here this morning. God, help them with the message that I preached. God, make the truth real to their heart. Burn it in their soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up here this morning, brother. Page 17 in your All-American Church hymn. <clears throat> Did you come?
Folks, don't you ever worry for a minute that God can't call preachers. If he can call an 11-year-old to preach like I heard the other day, and that 11-year-old was doing some, doing some good preaching, 11 years old, God can call preachers. Amen. morning. Anybody like to come down here and pray with us? I think you said you had a catheter, heart catheter schedule for this Wednesday. They're going to do a heart catheter on Judy. He was born with a heart murmur. <laughs> so, folks, if you'd like to come pray with us, we're going to anoint Jude, and uh, we appreciate the doctor and their wisdom, their skill, folks. We do. We, tr we, we appreciate them, but it's the Lord God we're going to trust. That's the one we're going to trust. He ultimately is the healer.